Welcome to Section 2, which provides an introduction to patterns and frameworks. The topics we'll cover in this section are applicable to many different domains, be they application domains, system infrastructure domains, and so on. Naturally, we'll be emphasizing patterns and frameworks related to concurrent and network software, since that's the focus of the course. There'll be a total of eight modules we'll cover in this section, and I'll give you a quick overview of each of the modules so you'll know what's coming. The first module we'll provide is going to give you an overview of some of the key concepts underlying patterns. A pattern is a reusable solution to a common problem that arises in a particular context or application domain. Patterns can be used to identify and name recurring structures and behaviors. They also help to capture software architecture knowledge that historically has been either locked in the heads of the experts or buried deep in the source code. Patterns can also codify design expertise and make it usable for both beginners and experts to make them more efficient, more productive. Patterns also help to enable systematic reuse. So people tend to spend less time rediscovering and reinventing core design insights and trying to learn through the school of hard knocks and trial and error. We're going to cover several dozen patterns in the course. But to start out with, I'd like to give you a flavor of four patterns that are commonly used in concurrent and network software systems. To do this, we're going to be focusing on patterns from a pair of books that form the classic literature in the field. And these books are design patterns, elements of reusable object-oriented software, sometimes called the Gang of Four or Goff book, as well as the book Pattern-Oriented Software Architecture, A System of Patterns, which is sometimes known as the POSA 1 book. These books were published about 20 years ago and give you a lot of the background information and some of the early views on how patterns should be documented, how patterns should be disseminated and applied to developing various types of software. If you take a look at those books, you'll see that, by and large, the patterns that are presented there are presented in isolation. The focus is on the individual patterns by themselves, with a few references to other patterns that help augment and supplement the patterns. A pattern collection, or a set of individual patterns, is useful, and it provides a great foundation. But it turns out, in practice, patterns are gregarious. They're social. They like to work together. And so for that reason, we're also going to spend some time covering some of the key pattern relationships, the involvement between and across the patterns. We'll talk about pattern complements, pattern compounds, pattern sequences, and most importantly, pattern languages. Pattern languages are groups of related patterns that work together to provide a vocabulary and a process for the orderly resolution of software design problems in particular domains. Patterns and pattern languages focus on design, and that's clearly important to be a, an effective software developer. But to truly become a master of software development, it also is important to understand not just the design aspects, the architectural aspects, but how to translate and transform the designs into working software. So to cover those topics, we're going to be focusing on frameworks, which are integrated sets of components that collaborate to provide a reusable architecture for a family of related applications. We're going to start off by summarizing some of the key framework concepts and describing their relationships to patterns. Frameworks can be characterized in several ways. They typically embody so-called inversion of control, where they own the event loop and you register handlers, and those handlers are called back by the framework when interesting events occur. Frameworks are also typified by domain-specific structures and functionality, thereby allowing better control over canonical interactions between various elements that are focused on covering a broader realm of reuse than just individual small components in isolation. Frameworks are also characterized by being semi-complete applications that can be customized and tailored by a hook methods so they can be used in a variety of different application domains where much of the work is done by the framework and only application-specific logic is carried out in ways that customize the hooks. In general, patterns help to improve extensibility and reuse of detailed designs and code. It's also worth understanding that patterns and frameworks are closely related. You can view a framework as an embodiment of pattern languages. Conversely, many pattern languages and patterns have been documented and identified by observing, 
refactoring, and reflecting upon frameworks that were being developed. In this course, we're going to do more than just talk about the concepts. We're also going to talk about a number of examples of industrial strength frameworks that are being used for concurrent and network software. We're going to start off by focusing on the Adaptive Communication Environment, or ACE, which is a set of C++ frameworks myself and my colleagues have been developing for over the past 20 years. Some of the frameworks that ACES provides that we'll be talking about include frameworks for synchronous and asynchronous event handling, connection establishment, service initialization, and service configuration, concurrency and synchronization, as well as, as, well as the composition of layered services. We're also going to talk about a more recent set of frameworks that are part of the Android platform. Android is a set of software services and layers and components and frameworks that focus on mobile application and mobile infrastructure development. Things like smartphones, tablets, and so on. In the context of Android, we'll talk about several topics. We'll first talk about some of the framework components that Android provides to be able to interact with users, be able to run various services in the background, to be able to mediate access to data and persistent stores. And then we'll also talk about some of the application frameworks that Android provides for doing things like location management, telephony, various kinds of event dissemination on an Android platform on a device, as well as being able to interact with app stores in order to be able to download applications and configure them into the phone in a safe and secure way. We're going to cover Android and Ace for a couple of reasons. First of all, both of these platforms were explicitly and intentionally designed using patterns. And so many of the topics and conversations we have about pattern relationships, pattern compounds, pattern languages fit seamlessly into the implementations that we'll find in these environments. Moreover, speaking of implementations, Android and ACE are both available in open source form, which means that you can not only understand these concepts by learning the key roles and responsibilities, being able to look at UML diagrams, looking at documentation, but you can also dig deep down into the code. You can see how these patterns are reflected in real C++ and Java code that's used in production systems. You can also see how to extend the elements that are part of Android and ACE to use in your applications. And you can find ways of being able to reuse the software, modify it, enhance it in all kinds of interesting ways that will get you closer to being able to achieve your own productivity goals. I'd like to be able to tell you that by using patterns and frameworks, all your problems will be solved. That your bugs will fix themselves, your software will be on time and under budget, you'll lose unwanted uh, inches and, and pounds, you'll be more fun at parties and so on. But there's obviously going to be more to it than that. So in this module of the course, we're going to spend some time having a frank discussion about the benefits and limitations of patterns and frameworks. As with any technology, there are places where patterns and frameworks make a lot of sense, and there's some other situations where you have to use them very carefully. So we'll spend some time talking about these different issues. We'll also discover that there's some issues and limitations with patterns that can be addressed by proper knowledge of frameworks. And likewise, there's issues with frameworks where you can understand how to build them and apply them more effectively if you have a deeper understanding of the patterns that embody them. Patterns and frameworks have been with us for a long time. The broad dissemination of information on patterns began about 20 years ago and the broad dissemination of frameworks began even earlier, about 25 years ago. So even though we have a lot of time to spend together in this course, there's no way we're going to be able to cover all the different topics and nuances for patterns and frameworks, especially as we start to move away from the core concurrency and networking focus that will be the emphasis of this class. So this module in the course will spend some time providing you with additional reference material, information about some important books to take a look at, various papers and articles, websites to go to, some source code to download and look at in order to deepen and broaden your understanding of these important concepts. It turns out about uh, a year ago in the spring of 2012, I gave a talk at a software architecture conference where I described some of the history of patterns and frameworks in the realm of distributed real-time and embedded systems. And if you take a look at the URL at the bottom of this slide, you'll find a transcript of my talk that will give you some of my historical perspective on how these technologies have evolved over the years. So that essentially rounds out the modules we'll be covering in this section of the course. But there's one more thing I want to give you some overview of and, and give you uh, some background in. We also have recorded 
an appendix which contains some background material, some videos that provide the context for some of the discussions we'll be having about concurrent and network software. And so for those of you who may be still new to the overall topics of patterns and frameworks, I encourage you to take a look at the module there that provides a case study of so-called gang of four patterns applied to an expression tree processing application. If you're experienced with the gang of four patterns, you can easily skip this particular module and not miss anything in the course. But for those of you who want some additional background understanding to deepen and broaden your learning, I recommend you take a look at this module, but you should probably watch it after you've watched the introduction portion and the overview of patterns, because it provides the context for the discussion of the gang of four. These patterns are not really specific to concurrency and networking, which is why they don't fall under the other parts of the course. But I think you'll appreciate getting some background to help you understand more about what we'll be covering and some of the history of some of the key patterns that have been described by the experts in the field over many years.